I'd like to introduce everybody to Tal Kainan. Tal is the chairman and CEO of KCPS Clarity, uh, which is the leader of the uh, emergence of the Israeli finance, financial services industry. Uh, Tal himself, I'll tell you the things that interest me, I'm putting this down. The, the things that interest me are that Tal was born in America, but came to Israel and became a Tayas Bechel Avil, went back to America, came back to Israel, and chose from here to be one of the leaders of the financial industry in Israel, uh, which his vision is one that I personally very much uh, can relate to, and hopefully all of us can because we all of us have something to learn from the direction that, according to Tal, Israel's going in. Uh, Tal's also the, the chairman of Koret, the Koret Development Fund, which anybody who doesn't know about it should do. Uh, it's a great honor for us to have you here as well, um, as everybody else who has been on this uh, stage today, and thank you very much for coming, joining, and uh, ending the day. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's really it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know a number of you. Uh, I admire what you're doing. Um, and it's, it's really an honor to be uh, invited to come and speak to you. You might be wondering why a finance professional was uh, invited to speak at a gathering of uh, Israel's leading non-for-profit uh, uh, leaders. I'm wondering that, too. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we are, we are in the same business. Uh, and I think we share a lot of, uh, uh, of the same goals. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my story, uh, and then tell you what, uh, what inspires me about what, what we're all doing here uh, uh, together. So as Johnny said, I'm originally American. I grew up, uh, I was born in Miami, and grew up uh, kind of along the east coast of the United States. Uh, I came here as a uh, junior in college on, a, on an exchange program, you, as a Zionist who believed in Israel, and uh, that's actually uh, the guy who's coming in. Sorry to out you for being late, Donny. But one of the people responsible for me being here. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, but as a, as a student in university here, really uh, found that this is a place I can, I can live, uh, and I can love living here. And that's, uh, th that's a special gift, I think, when your uh, idealism lines up with, uh, uh, with the way you want to live your life on a day-to-day -day level. Um, and it was a gift I think I uh, was lucky enough to recognize at the time. So at the end of that year, I, uh, I became a citizen. I made Aliyah. Uh, my Hebrew was decent at the time, not great. But I did find myself in, uh, in the Air Force uh, in, in flight school. Uh, which was a struggle, maybe for the time being the struggle of my life, but, uh, but something that I loved. And again, I had the wonderful gift of realizing that I am in the right place at the right time for me, uh, which is something I hope I share with a lot of you uh, here today. And that is a gift. I, I think most of us n never get that, I never get to be standing in the right place at the right time, not wanting to be anywhere else in the world doing anything but what we're doing uh, at the moment. Uh, so that evolved into a career as an F-16 pilot uh, in the Air Force, uh, which, uh, which I loved. I did it for eight years. Uh, met my wife, Amber, at the end of that uh, period, and together we decided that uh, that was chapter one, uh, and it was ending. Uh, and I think, lucky for me, I felt there were a lot of ways I could contribute here uh, in, in a way that was more special and more directed than what I was uh, doing in the Air Force. And one of the nice things that we have in, in the Israeli Air Force is Miluim, so you don't really have to stop, uh, uh, which has been wonderful. Uh, so uh, I, I left the Air Force. I went back to the US uh, for a graduate degree, uh, joined a private equity firm called Giza here in Israel, and uh, worked at Giza for a number of years until I became a partner there and uh, had kind of tick ticked all the boxes I wanted to tick uh, for myself in, in the private equity world, uh, and then sat down and, 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 and had a real think about what do I want to do with my life uh, in my career. Uh, this is not the end, uh, as far as I was concerned. And I've been kicking around a lot of ideas. You know, I'm obviously very passionate uh, about Israel and Israeli society and about the Jewish people. Uh, and I definitely thought about going a route that would um, uh, dedicate me full time to that. Uh, but I also had some business ambitions that I still hadn't, uh, uh, still hadn't really addressed. And one of them is the following, which I think is, you know, is, is a very interesting opportunity for Israel and relates directly to what I think all of us are doing uh, in this room. Uh, and that is, 
yeah, we look at economic growth in Israel. Today we're very focused on, uh, on the, the gaps, income gaps uh, in Israeli society. In my opinion, the, the bigger problem is opportunity gaps in Israeli society. Some people are born into a place, thanks. Some people are uh, born into a place where they have access to tremendous opportunity, and some people in Israel have a very, very narrow uh, opportunity set, and that's something that we can't allow to uh, uh, continue um, in this society. There are a lot of things that we're missing, and I'm sure you guys experience these things every day uh, on the road to solving these, uh, th th these big problems for Israel. And that if we don't have an economic engine that's driving uh, growth and really fueling all of our uh, collective efforts uh, in these fields, I'm not sure we're gonna get there. One of the things that really uh, shocked me, and it should shock everybody, uh, I think, is the emergence of Israel as a technology superpower. Okay, in 1990, in Israel, there really was no technology industry. There, there were some defense electronic fir firms and maybe a few companies that did consumer uh, tech uh, a few software companies like Amdocs, uh, a few semiconductor design companies, but not an industry, that, that, that didn't exist. In 1998, we overtook Canada to have more NASDAQ listings than any country in the world other than the United States. Think about that for a minute. That's, that's an eight year gap. Not more per capita listings than any country in the world, more listings than any country in the world. I think in 98, 1998, we're probably six and a half million, seven million people uh, in Israel. More NASDAQ listings than any country in the world. Countries with hundreds of millions of, uh, of people. I think at that point, there were two countries that had over a billion people. And here, this little uh, country that's spending most of its time uh, and most of its human energy doing things other than building the economy, defending its survival, uh, achieves that type of prominence from a standing start in eight years. It, it's shocking. Um, you know, I was shocked by a lot of negative things when I showed up in Israel. I think a lot of the people who, who didn't grow up here were as well. You know, I, had my, I ordered my first phone line uh, in 1990 uh, in Israel. I was a student at Tel Aviv University. I had an apartment in Tel Aviv. And the previous tenant of the apartment had a phone. Uh, so the line existed physically. Uh, it was just a matter of somebody flipping a switch and connecting my new line. Uh, and I waited two months for that. And I was told by my neighbors, that's, that's not so bad. It's not the best, but it's not so bad. And definitely don't call them because you're gonna go on the blacklist and, uh, and, and you, won't get, uh, you won't get service. To me, it was a huge shock that we could be, this is the, I mean, I, I came as naive as they come, um, that we, the Jewish state, we must be the, 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 the kind of uh, cutting edge of progress in all fields. Uh, how could it be that we're so far behind in, in, in something as basic as customer service? This is not even a technology uh, challenge. And yet here we are. But on the other side, we have this amazing capacity in Israel, having lagged behind much of the world you know, for generations, to leapfrog and go straight to the top. And it's incredible. And it should be empowering, I think, for, for all of us. And technology is, is the model. So I'm a partner at, uh, at Giza, and I'm thinking about leaving. Uh, I want to do something else, and a tension that's been kind of brewing in my head for a long time uh, s suddenly comes to the, uh, to the forefront, and that is, here we are, this kind of over overnight sensation in the, uh, in the technology industry. Uh, it's an industry that is based on nothing but incredible human talent and a high density of it. Okay, and that's what we have here. We like to complain about everything we don't have, and it's true, right? We don't have water, we don't have uh, cheap labor, we don't have uh, natural resources, we don't have strategic depth. Okay, so we shouldn't be investing as, as an economy. I, I heard you had a, a talk from the uh, uh, Minister of Finance this morning. If we're looking at economic planning long-term in Israel, we probably shouldn't be investing in, 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 in cheap labor-intensive industries, right? The textile industry is probably not gonna make a huge comeback uh, in Israel nor is agriculture or, 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 or anything like that. Not honestly, we're not, we can't compete with Morocco on growing oranges. But we can compete incredibly in industries that depend on that high density of human talent. And the, the tech model, I think, proved that. It didn't just demonstrate it, it proved it. We really hit it out of the park there. And if you look around and see what else are we, uh, what other industries are based solely on outstanding, expensive, but outstanding human talent, Financial services is number one. Tech is number two. Financial services is number one. And I think I can say it in this audience. Uh, is this uh, like online or something? 
think I can say it in this audience. Uh, the, there are a lot of uh, Jews represented in the technology industry, for sure. You know, guys like uh, Larry Ellison through to guys like Mark Zuckerberg. Financial services, I hate to say it, is a Jewish industry. If anyone's uh, uh, familiar with the US legal concept of je double jeopardy, now you can't be tried tw twice for the same crime. Uh, so if you were punished, you served a sentence for a crime you did not commit upon release, theoretically, and there are a lot of uh, screenplays and, and uh, 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 movies that have been written on this theme, theoretically now you can commit the crime. You can't be tried, tried twice for the same crime. So I would say we've served our time as a people for the last thousand years or so, 1,500 years. Uh, might as well commit the crime. And to me it is an irony that the Jewish state does not have a financial services industry that is worthy of export. Forget about superpower status like we are in technology. It's a huge irony. Um, and I would say the, the, the value of an industry like that, uh, very similar to technology. Look, look what that, that industry has done for us in terms of job creation in Israel, government income in Israel, our international reputation. Today, there is something that people think about when they, when they hear the word Israel other than uh, our, you know, our various conflicts here, and that is tech savvy, that's innovation. Uh, that industry did all that, and maybe even most importantly, I think that industry imported an incredible bed of human talent. Jews from around the world, from North America, from Europe, from uh, the former Soviet Union, who are today driving that industry, but beyond driving the industry, just the presence of those people in Israel has contributed massively. My guess is a lot of people, I know that a lot of people in this audience are exactly of that, uh, of that profile. And it tends to be a world, worldly wise, aware, conscious, socially conscious uh, group of people in a way that's very different from the indigenous population in Israel. Uh, and I think that's been a huge contribution. So, uh, I'm gonna spare you the details of the capital markets reforms that passed in the Knesset in 2004 that allowed this, but uh, suffice it to say that from, to, from January 2005, there's really nothing on a regulatory basis that blocks us from becoming a financial services superpower. Uh, so I left Giza in 2005, the end of 2005, uh, to launch this firm. Uh, and what we do is we manage global portfolios for clients around the world. Uh, at the beginning, all of our clients were Israeli, like a tech company, we, uh, we establish beachheads in other markets, usually with Jewish help, uh, to be clear. Uh, but today, we're a very generic firm. So we have clients in, uh, in Manhattan uh, that are not Jewish, uh, that have no connection uh, to Israel, for whom we manage large portfolios that are global. The portfolios have nothing to do with Israel. The clients have nothing to do with Israel. The only thing that has anything to do with Israel uh, is the fact that their money is managed from Israel with a, a bunch of very talented uh, 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 people sitting in Tel Aviv. We have offices outside, but, uh, but most of the investment management actually happens in Tel Aviv. And to that extent, we are very much like a uh, checkpoint software or an Amdocs, other than the scale, uh, but the same model. We are selling a generic service, uh, and the only reason we sell it from Israel is because you can do it better from Israel. There is more talent per firm to hire that talent in Tel Aviv than there is in Manhattan. Now, that's a statement that anyone who's uh, spent time on Wall Street should be uh, challenging. Uh, and I challenge you to come in and see who we're hiring in Tel Aviv and who we're hiring in, uh, in New York. Great people in New York. But in terms of investment management talent, Tel Aviv is far and away a better place to be hiring. To be clear, the trick in that is the denominator, right? There's just not that many firms hiring here. In, in New York, we have 10,000 firms that we're competing with to hire. So, we borrowed a, a model from the technology industry. Uh, it works for our industry. Uh, I want to say that it works for society in general, and certainly for everything that we're doing in this room. Um, and there's a secret sauce in that model that I call Jewish innovation. Uh, what's Jewish innovation? It, it can be practiced by non-Jews, by the way, uh, Jewish innovation. Uh, but I look at it like this. For, for the last 1,500 years, 1,600 years, Jews around the world have spoken three languages, at least. Okay, we've prayed in Hebrew. 
Uh, we spoke within our communities in the Jewish languages of the diaspora. So if you lived around here, you spoke uh, Judeo-Arabic. If you lived in uh, North Africa or, or perhaps Southern Europe, you spoke Ladino. Uh, if you lived in Europe, you spoke Yiddish. And you also spoke the lingua franca of your region. That's what you conducted business in. That's what you conducted affairs with the government in, whether that was Spanish or German or Russian or wh whatever it was. And you had a command of those languages, at least. Many Jews spoke, spoke much more than that. That, together with the fact that we had to keep moving around, unfortunately, I think made us the most cosmopolitan people in the world. Uh, and in that sense, we were much more informed uh, than most people. How does that impact innovation? Yeah, I, I like to think of the analogy of a, a I don't know this person, but a, a Jewish chemist in a university town in northern Europe let's say Heidelberg, uh, and a Lutheran chemist in Heidelberg. I can, and, and we're, let's say, 200 years ago or so. I can picture the Lutheran chemist being very satisfied being the best in his field in Heidelberg, uh, because in many ways that was his universe. He didn't spend much time outside of Heidelberg, if at all. He might have gone to a conference in Berlin once in a while or, or, or something like that, but, but really 99% uh, of his life was in Heidelberg. He's, his innovation was informed by the current wisdom in Heidelberg. So if something was going on in Copenhagen or in Hamburg or in London, he might not really know about it or he might not know about it fast. The Jewish chemist wasn't like that. The Jewish chemist had, first of all, relatives all over the place, and he was being informed uh, by people in their native languages often uh, about the cutting edge in his, uh, uh, in his field. So he was innovating. Uh, in a way that was informed. Okay, if there was work that was already done, there were wheels to reinvent, he didn't have to reinvent them. Okay, he knew that, he, he was much more conscious of what was going on uh, in the world around him. Aside from that, if he had a, com a competitive bone in his body, which I think most of us uh, do, he couldn't sleep at night if he knew that there, were, uh, there was a woman in Copenhagen doing work in his field a little bit more advanced than his. I mean, his benchmark was set globally, not locally. That was always a Jewish quality. And I think that's something that has propelled Jewish achievement uh, uh, over the centuries, um, much more than a lot of the things that we attribute Jewish achievement to. I think it's something that's, uh, th that's also been uh, traditionally unique to us as a, as a people. When we came to Israel, we needed to fuse cultures from very disparate parts of the world and very different cultures. Okay, the, the, uh, the first meeting of the Yemenite Jew with the Polish Jew, I, I think it took a long time before you figured out what you had in common other than Shema Yisrael. Uh, and I think one of the tools that allowed us to really uh, congeal as a society was the uh, revival of the Hebrew language as a modern, uh, functioning, thriving language. I think that was a beautiful, uh, beautiful experiment, and I'm not sure we would have survived as a, as a nation uh, without the Hebrew language. So it, it, I think it definitely played a critical role in the, uh, in, in the success of Zionism. It also came with a cost. Uh, and I think today we're beginning to feel the, uh, uh, feel the cost of our reliance of the Hebrew language as, 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 as a core of identity. And it's happening for two reasons, one internal and one external. The internal reason is today in Israel you can get by very well with just Hebrew. Um, and I think the average, and I'm uh, quite active in education, I, I don't have statistics for you, but I can say it uh, uh, anecdotally, and I think there are a few people that would disagree. The average high school graduate in Israel is not fluent in English. He's proficient in English, he's not fluent in English. He's not reading Shakespeare, he's not catching the nuance even of a, of, a, of a CNN anchor person reading the news, he's not catching the nuance of the English language. Uh, in many ways, that represents a massive loss. And in many ways, I think we're cultivating the least Jewish generations of Jews in the last 1,500 years right here in Israel. Uh, and to me, that's a threat. Uh, it's also a big opportunity for the people in this room. Uh, but it's a threat to us, I think, as a, uh, as a society. We are losing touch with benchmarking, so we don't have that Copenhagen benchmark anymore, uh, or a lot of us don't have that. 
uh, we are not innovating in a global context. We're not conscious of the, 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 the context in which we're, we're innovating. Uh, obviously, with exceptions, the 180,000 people out of 8 million that drive the tech economy are exceptions. By the way, they speak English. Uh, there are exceptions to that, clearly. But the other 7.8 uh, million of us, uh, I, I think, are encountering this as a big problem. Unfortunately, there are two external trends that are exacerbating this. One is that the world is improving. Today, you don't have to be a persecuted people looking over his shoulder speaking three languages in order to be cosmopolitan. You just need the internet and some consciousness that that's important. Okay, so in Sweden, for example, there are 600 master's degrees programs that are taught in English for Swedes. The, the idea being you do not get anywhere in this world without, uh, uh, without a full command of the English language. Uh, so you see education systems surging ahead in South Korea, in Finland, today in Poland, certainly in the Scandinavian countries, while we're becoming average. Okay? In the 1970s, Israel ranked number one on, on PISA equivalent uh, mathematics uh, exams for high school students. Today we're average. We're like Malta, Georgia, that's what we look like today. Uh, as a Jew, that, I find that uh, a, a tragic irony that, that, that that's where we're ranked uh, um, in the world. So we're less conscious of, of, of everyone else surging ahead as we either stay in place or, or, or recede. And the second is that if German was a useful lingua franca for German Jews and Austrian Jews and Hungarian Jews 100 years ago, and Spanish was a use, useful lingua franca for Spanish Jews 600 years ago, English today is by far the most powerful, ubiquitous lingua franca in the history of mankind. Bar none, nothing comes close. If a Chinese business person is conducting business with a Japanese business person today, it's in English. The EU is run in English. The UN, as Johnny knows, is run in English. Organizations, international organizations that have no English-speaking members are run in English. The Eurozone, 17 members, not a single English-speaking country, three French-speaking countries, two German-speaking countries, two Dutch-speaking countries, it's run in English. There are no English-speaking countries represented there. This is the lingua franca of the 21st century. If I had to bet, I would say it's the lingua franca of the, 21st, of the 22nd century as well. We need a full command of that language. Uh, and unfortunately, in Israel, we are uh, uh, shortchanging ourselves. And when I talk about language, it's not the ability to read a newspaper. That's also important. That, that, that's great. And to read literature and to read journals and whatever it is. But it's also a nuanced connection with the trends that are driving the world today. And as the world accelerates, I think our, uh, the accessibility of those trends is, is important. So I use English, I was going to say with a capital E, I guess it's with a capital E in, uh, in either case. But English in the bigger sense, an in, in understanding of a global canon uh, that's emerging. And that's something that I don't think we can, uh, uh, we can afford to lose. So if there are two critical tools, and I think a lot of people in this room uh, represent them, to driving Israeli, the Israeli economy and I think Israeli society forward today, I would encourage you to think about English. I would encourage you to think about our relations with the diaspora. Because the second thing that's happening, and I think that's uh, critical in this room, is we've always been linked. We've always been linked. We've watched out for each other. We've helped each other. We've been conscious of each other. Uh, and, and this is very much connected to the English uh, issue, is I think for the first time in a very long time, the two biggest groups, and I think about 90% of Jews in the world today, uh, live either in Israel or in North America. It's about 90%, maybe a little bit less, uh, are increasingly unfamiliar to each other. And that is a massive threat. It's part of the same problem, but I think it's a massive threat. And it's the people in this room, I think, who can address it. Uh, not necessarily directly, and I'll conclude with, uh, with some ideas of how, how to do it, uh, or how we can all... Uh, um, be doing it. So what you guys are, in, are, are uh, what you guys do, and I know a lot of your organizations, uh, in some cases quite uh, intimately, uh, has to do with empowerment. Um, you know, we all try to empower the people who work with us, the people who we serve. Uh, I, I think, in, on, in a generic sense, we've all, I think, recognized. I sat in on one of the panels here, and I and, 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 and I hear what. what you guys are talking about very similar to the things that we talk about uh, uh, at our place of business. 
Uh, empowerment is, is a critical tool. What you guys come with, though, is an informed empowerment. Uh, you have credibility because you've been around. Uh, and it's something unique that I think you bring to the table in Israel, and something that, that, that will be uh, critical in driving us forward. Just, Just to, to be, make sure, sure we're talking about the same thing, uh, anybody know Tal Ben Shachal, the happiness guy? He's wonderful. I, you should read his book. He's great. He has a trick which I use and I recommend, which is count a few of your blessings every night before you go to bed. Just two or three things that you're happy for. I love my daughter. Fantastic. Uh, you know, that meal was great. Uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Great. Check. Done. Definitely works. Makes you happier. Another trick, which is a little bit more obscure, um, is do something nice for somebody else every morning. Uh, important to do it in the morning. Uh, bring a cup of coffee to the guard uh, at the parking lot where you work. Uh, throw your neighbor's newspaper you know, over his fence so he doesn't have to walk out to the street. Something small, that's nice every day. What that does, other than you know, making maybe an incremental improvement in somebody else's day, which is nice, is it reminds us that we can make an incremental improvement in somebody else's day. Uh, it empowers us. I do this. And I find it's very much a kind of a, 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 an alignment of my compass. It reminds me of who I want to be, uh, who I hopefully am. Uh, and the rest of my day, that's why I've got to do it in the morning, the, the rest of my day is very much inspired by that small, kind of uh, silly act in the morning. That's empowerment. It's reminding us that we are actors. We are not victims. We're actors. And I think what, one of the things that you guys bring to the table when I talk about informed empowerment um, is that. In Israel, I think we have suffered in many ways from too much help. Uh, and we've come to think of ourselves over one or two generations as a recipient nation, as a recipient community, as a victim uh, in many ways. So one of the things that struck me most in the last, uh, in the last month or two, I, my, my, my daughter did a project in Uganda with an organization that, that I know some of you know called Innovation Africa. Uh, which does great things for people in Africa. So she did a kind of solar power project for, a, uh, for an orphanage in, in, in Uganda. But the striking thing to me that it does is, is its effect on the Israelis who are involved with it, like our family. Uh, and it took us to a place where we're thinking of ourselves as people who are capable of changing, in this case, 400 lives in Africa for the better. Uh, doesn't matter, you don't have to go to Uganda to do this. I think you could do it right here. Uh, but we need to remind ourselves that we are empowered. All of us are. I mean, almost all of us can throw the newspaper over the fence. Uh, almost all of us, and I'm talking about all of us in this country, uh, can do something kind for another person, uh, help another person, change another person's reality in a small way, medium way, big way. Uh, we are empowered. Uh, the, the last anecdote I'll tell is, is from Colette. Um, so you know, we, we're quite active in the micro-lending space uh, in Israel. One of the practices that we employ in micro-lending is called cross-collateralization. Okay, so if we go to a, a town or a village, uh, we try not to make one loan as a standalone to a small business. What we try to do is do three or four loans together, but everybody's on the hook for the other's loans. Okay, so if Sam uh, does not make a payment, I've got to come up with the money because I took a loan as well. And what that does is create interdependencies. Okay, so we have three or four people together who are empowered to help each other out. Okay, because if they don't, we, we, all, we all fall together. Uh, so that does wonderful things for people's creditworthiness. That's great. We get our money back, which is very important to us. We couldn't sustain the, uh, the organization otherwise. But I think one of the side benefits is even more important, is it creates a sense of empowerment in these communities, is that people can look and say, without me, these other three people can't make it happen. I've got to pull my weight. I've got to do something. And, and I think what you see afterwards, and we, we haven't compiled statistics on this, but, I, but, but I'd be willing to bet it works, is after these people do get off the ground financially and get their businesses running, they become active in their community in helping other people. And they stop seeing themselves as recipients and start seeing themselves as donors. And at the end of the day, I think maybe the biggest change we can make as a group in this room uh, in Israel is start, starting to see ourselves as empowered. This is one of the most incredible places on Earth. And it's incredible because of the amazing density of human talent. I don't think it, it exists anywhere else. I've been around too. I don't think it, it exists anywhere else. We don't have to just be on the receiving end of things. 
some of us do, and it's fine to help each other out. I think that, that, that's wonderful. But if we can empower ourselves and empower each other to make change, I think that's fantastic. Uh, I know a lot of what you guys do. I'm inspired by what you guys do. I'm impressed uh, about a lot, of things, uh, a lot of things I see. I think we have partnerships with some of the organizations uh, represented here. I admire the tenacity it takes to do what you do every day in Israel. I know it's not always the smoothest uh, uh, experience in the world. But I want to thank you for having me here. I'm definitely honored uh, uh, to be here and, and inspired by your example. So thank you. <laughs>